Today's message uh, is probably not going to bring me new friends, or maybe it will. But uh, I'm not here to make friends, although that's always good, of course. But uh, my primary point is to speak the truth, and the truth from God's Word. So let's dive into it. The title uh, probably uh, uh, attracts many people. Because they have something to say about it, and that's uh, that's not not uh, nothing wrong with that. Um, but we are mainly going to look at God's word. Jesus calls Satan the father of lies, and he's the one, Satan, who deceives the whole world. He does not only lie to those who reject God. But actually, he certainly lies, and specifically lies, to those who believe in God. And more specifically, those that have found the way. Jesus. He's the one who twists and perverts God's word. And uh, sows the seeds of false doctrines. And um, it is us whom he targets uh, with his fiery darts. And therefore, we must be vigilant, because he is ready to devour. And um, you who know scripture, realize that all these words I use are from scripture. God gave a very clear and simple commandment to Adam and Eve. Do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the consequence of that sin was also made clear. Actually, Eve literally repeated it to Satan, to the serpent, when he came to deceive her. She said that they would surely die if they would eat from it. And what did the serpent say? You shall not surely die. He went 180 degrees against what God had said. And... Um, by that, he was uh, also uh, implying that God had lied. Now, here is a basic principle. One, has always, one always has to go against God's word in order to lay the foundation for a false doctrine. The false doctrine was, you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And it was uh, accompanied then with his promise, with his lie, that lay at its foundation, you will surely not die. Now that is appealing to man to be able to taste from sin, to give in to the lusts of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the lust, uh, the pride of heart, and uh, yet not die. And Satan was saying to Adam and Eve with so many words, you are immortal, God cannot make you die, he can't touch you. And there is no greater lie than that. In theology, this is called the doctrine of eternal security. And Osas, once saved, always saved, leans on that same principle. Hear me out. Once you've accepted Jesus as your personal savior, you are eternally secured. That is the basis of this doctrine. Not even God can touch you. Seems that you are as gods. God in that case, is simply bound to accept you and to give you salvation, no matter what happens to you after you accept Jesus, or after you say that you accept Jesus. His grace simply eternally covers you. He has to. Now, during the Crusades of uh, Billy Graham, the hymn, Just As I Am, Lord, was popularized. And though this is written with the best intentions, um, many take it that God um, accepts us just as we are. The words say, just as I am, thou wilt receive. Well, yes and no. God can and will not accept us just as we are. If that was so, 
then there would be no need for repentance, there would be no need for change, for rebirth, there would be no need for Jesus. Why need a new man if the old man is good enough? And that is what, why it appeals to so many people. They don't need to change anything in their lives and stay just as they are. Only say the sinner's prayer once and we're good to go. It so fits today's woke ideology, where people are told that God loves them just the way they are. We're all children of God. Well, that is not true. Yes, God loves the world and he doesn't want anyone to perish. And we are all God's creation. But we only become God's children when we repent of our sins and accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. That means when we give him lordship over our lives. Then we are adopted into his family. But it seems that many regard repentance as works. And since we are not saved by works, repentance is now a taboo word for many. Yes, we are saved by grace, and that is, uh, however, not the end. It's just the beginning. Peter writes in 1 Peter 1, verse 14 through 17, As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the Father, who without respect of persons judged according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here on earth in fear. You see what happens here? It's a one, two, three punch. Uh, he speaks about no more according to the former lusts, that means a change of heart, a change of conduct, repentance, turning around. Then he, he speaks about um, being holy. That means, again, a change of conduct. Uh, that means living according to the new man, the newness of, of life. Eh? Walk according to the newness of life. And then he speaks about a God who judges according to every man's work. In other words, it matters what we do. God cannot accept us just as we are. Remember, he did not even accept his own son once he took our sins upon him. And God the Father had to forsake him, to desert him. That is why Jesus says on the cross, Matthew 27 verse 46, in about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani? That is to say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God had forsaken him. He could not accept him the way he was. He accepted the sacrifice. That's another thing. But we cannot change ourselves. It can only be through Jesus. And not by a one-time prayer. But, I, but by having him live through us permanently. Paul writes to the Galatians in Galatians 2, verse 20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. The danger of osas, once saved, always saved doctrine, is that it makes many believe that they can live their lives uh, their way, once they have said that they accept Jesus, and usually they said it once. Of course, God wants us to confess that we accept Jesus. He wants us to make that life-changing decision once. But above all, he wants us to live it. For example, when a criminal is absolved of uh, committing a certain crime, uh, and he commits another crime later, then he is still guilty of that later crime. One-time pardon does not mean that he can just do whatever he wants. Or to put it in a different example, when you get married, you say yes to the marriage vows. 
That doesn't mean that you keep on living as before and you just ignore your spouse because you have said yes once. No, the relationship has to be maintained on a daily basis, otherwise it will not hold. So if a Christian sets his will against God and God's way of life, the sacrifice of Jesus no longer applies. And that Christian runs the risk of losing the salvation that was promised to him. Paul puts it this way, Hebrews 10 verse 26, For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. It's very clear. He does not say that we must do works. It's not what he says. But he does say that willfully sinning has dire consequences. It is like spitting in God's face. He who gave everything for us. The text then continues to make it even more clear. Verse 27. But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy, who hath trodden under foot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongs unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord, and again the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And Peter adds to that in 1 Peter 4 verse 17, For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? Note that he says that obey not the gospel of God. He doesn't say that those that receive not the gospel of God. It's not a matter of one time receiving or hearing or acknowledging. It's obeying. It's living it. And if we lead a life of sin, willfully and unrepented, we will reap the punishment that those sins deserve. God is just. We must produce fruit worthy of repentance. Otherwise, there is no repentance, and God is not mocked. Now, I said at the start, it always begins by going against God's word. Therefore, we must carefully look at what the word says. And most support, supporters of the Osas doctrine will quote the verse of Ephesians 2, verse 8. By grace you have, uh, by grace you have been saved through faith alone. That is, however, how the verse sits in the minds of many. However, that's not what it says. Let's read it. Ephesians 2 verse 8. For by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Notice that it does not say by faith alone. The word alone is not in there. And that was added actually by Luther who wanted to oppose the works that the Catholic Church uh, required. And although his motivation might have been good, you just can't change the word of God. And Luther also designated the epistle of, uh, of James as an epistle of straw. Why? Because clearly James speaks about the importance of work, of conduct. And that was, of course, misused by the Catholic Church to, uh, to, to motivate the fact that they required works. It still is. But James speaks about the importance of works, of conduct, not in order to get saved, but as a result of salvation. James writes in chapter 2, verse 14, What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man said uh, he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? Which is, of course, a rhetorical question. And in verse 17, even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. There must be fruit of repentance. There must be a change of conduct. If such a great gift of salvation has no impact on, on a man 
to change his life, his being, then what faith has he? But James was not in disagreement with Paul at all. See what Paul writes to the Romans, Romans 2 verse 13. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. It cannot be that we are saved and still willfully ignore and disobey God's will. Obeying God's word must be the follow-up of salvation. Jesus makes it also very clear, abundantly clear, I would say, in John chapter 14 and chapter 15. And I want to pick out a few verses. Verse 15, there he says, if, the keyword here is if, if you love me, keep my commandments. In verse 21, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. In verse 23, Jesus answered and said unto him, if a man love me, he will keep my words. Verse 24, he that loveth me not, keepeth not my sayings, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. Chapter 15, verse 10, if you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. And in verse 6, if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch which is withered, and men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Notice that Jesus is speaking to his disciples. Notice also how two different things are cunningly put together in order to create the Osas doctrine. One is how salvation is obtained, and the other is how salvation is maintained. It is obtained by grace through faith, and not by works, it's a gift but it is maintained, it is kept by producing fruit worthy of repentance. By holding on to your crown, it is kept in fear and trembling. By obedience, by putting on the new man daily and with much labor. And all these are quoted from verses. That's what scripture says. And it's just a selection of the many verses that speak about our conduct after salvation after salvation has been received. But Osa's supporters will sweep them all away under the rug because salvation is a gift of grace. And that is actually the same as Satan saying, you shall not surely die. And that is a blatant lie. See what Paul writes to the Hebrew Christians in Hebrews 6, verse 6 through 12. If they shall fall away, and I stop right here, this means it's possible. To fall away otherwise all these words would be useless if they shall fall away to renew them again into repentance seeing they crucify to themselves the son of god afresh and put him into uh, an open shame for the earth which drinketh in a rain that cometh oft upon it and bringeth forth herbs meat for them by whom it is dressed receiveth blessing from god but that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing whose end is to be burned. But, beloved, we are persuaded better things of you, and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shewed toward his name, in that you have ministered to the saints, and do minister. And we desire that every one of you do shew the same diligence to the full assurance of hope, unto the end, that you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promise. We've spoken about this scripture before. The rain mentioned is a free gift of grace. It falls upon all, but it is meant to bring forth fruit, fruit of repentance. If it doesn't, the end is to be burned. And he then speaks of things that accompany salvation. In verse 9. He speaks of work and labor in verse 10. Uh, work and labor and oh, he speaks then of faith and patience unto the end, not only in the beginning. And it is perfectly in line with what John the Baptist said in Matthew 3 verse 8. Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. It doesn't end with repentance, it begins there. In verse 10 he says, and now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. 
Therefore every tree which bringeth forth not forth good fruit is hewn down and is cast into the fire. It's not just a matter of growing a tree, it's a matter of growing fruit. And look at what Peter writes. First of all, look at to whom he writes. It's very important to have that context correct in 2 Peter, 2, uh, 2 Peter 1, verse 1. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ, etc. And then he continues to say, um, uh, in uh, verses 10 and 11, he gives advice on um, how to behave after being saved, after receiving the gift of salvation. Wherefore, the, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is saying, do these things in order to secure your election. In other words, the implication is, if you do not do these things, your uh, election is not secured. Then in chapter 2, he brings up the fact that there are false prophets and false teachers among them. Again, he's speaking to the church, to Christians. 2 Peter 2, verse 1. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Now why would Satan put false teachers in the church if there was no chance for people to fall away? Think about it. Actually, no, we can be led away and fall unto our destruction, as we just read. And with that warning, uh, Peter also ends in his second epistle, emphasizing that, um, uh, that with that he's in total agreement with Paul. Uh, he writes in uh, 2 Peter 3, verse 14 through 17, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent, be careful that you may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless, and account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. Even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. He's saying, I agree with Paul. He wrote the same thing. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, which are some things hard to be understood. That is... Uh, a statement where with he's saying you have to pay maybe a bit extra attention because it is not always easy to understand this and which they that are unlearned are unstable to rest as they do also the other scriptures so he is saying here those that have a hard time understanding this also have a hard time understanding other scriptures what are these other scriptures that is what we now know as the old testament that were the, the, the established written uh, scrolls that uh, were um, present uh, in those days uh, and of course the epistles uh, of Paul and uh, of Peter himself and the others and the Gospels they were all um, in the process of, of becoming part of uh, scripture um, but he says uh, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction you therefore, beloved, seeing you know these things before, beware lest you also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. So, clearly it is possible to be led away by the error of the wicked, just as Eve was led away, and Adam subsequently. So, Paul... John the Baptist, Jesus, Peter, James, they are all in agreement. And I, there would be much more scriptures that I could read. God, through Jesus, did everything possible to save us and to reconcile us to him. But a covenant has two parties, and we must up, uphold our side and continue in the faith. We must, as Paul writes, Work out our own salvation in fear and trembling, 
lest we run in vain. Yes, many run in vain. We cannot afford to take God's salvation for granted and think that we have some eternal security without obedience to God. But we rather have to make our election sure. The free gift of salvation is way too precious to treat it as something cheap. Now I should stop here, but I want to add one thing to those that nevertheless stick to Osas. Um, think, uh, think of this. What if I am wrong? It means I haven't lost anything and I live the life that is morally better and closer to the will of God. What if you are wrong? Talking to those that stick with Osas. What if you are wrong? You are in danger of losing everything for all eternity. Is it worth the risk? Ponder these uh, scriptures that I, uh, I gave you and um, think about this. Think carefully about what God says and um, what the consequence is either way. Um, I hope it's, uh, it's a blessing to you and um, not a, a source for strife or uh, argument because it's not meant that way. It's really meant to bless you. Amen.